something interesting is happening. No, not that. This. There's been a growing shift in how the world perceives psychoactive drugs. When I say world, I don't just mean regular people on the streets. I mean governments of nations are starting to entertain the idea of decriminalizing and legalizing such narcotics, most notably cannabis. There are many reasons for this, which we'll get into later. What we need to establish is there's one country that has rejected all calls to re-examine its drug laws, and that's Singapore. Singapore has dug its anti-drug heels so deep into the ground that only its head is above the surface. Singapore is committed to this position because it has done extensive scientific testing on cannabis and other illegal narcotics and deemed such substances to be detrimental to human health. I'm kidding, they didn't. Singapore's harsh and rigid drug laws originate from preconceived notions based on imaginary data. This is where things get interesting. Because virtually everyone in Singapore has easy access to the internet, the population can't help but be exposed to global viewpoints, including ones that do not jive with local norms. So, in order to maintain public support for its never-ending war on drugs, the big G of Singapore has had to step up its anti-drug messaging efforts. There are anti-drug posters prominently plastered at places where youths frequent. Young anti-drug ambassadors have been recruited to convince their peers not to ingest or inhale anything that could give them reprieve and perspective on their adolescent struggles. And don't forget social media advertisements and videos distorting the consequences of taking gateway drugs like cannabis. On YouTube, there's a video published in 2019 called Last Days, made by Singapore's Central Narcotics Bureau. It shows a twitchy ethnic minority-looking man in a hoodie, entering a convenience store. There, he bumps into a Chinese-looking boy playing on his mobile phone. Something comes over this supposedly drug adult man who stabs the boy with a knife and then snatches his phone. Obviously, he wants to pawn off the phone so he can get his next fix. But here's the twist. He's not interested in buying from the shady underground drug dealers. He wants the good stuff from the brightly lit, clean, legal pharmacy. The ad was about the horrors you should expect if currently banned drugs are legalized. There are at least three things about the video that make us all dumber for having seen it. The first is that the legalization of drugs doesn't have to mean that anyone can walk into a store and buy a whole bag of psychedelics like candy. Like anything else, the big G gets to dictate how the easing of drug policies will look like. The second issue is the ethnicities of the drug addict and the victim. They could have easily made it less loaded, less controversial, by having both of them be of the same race, for example. For a government-approved production, it sure wants to reinforce prejudices and incite racial tensions. It's disappointing, considering regular residents have lost their jobs and been slapped with fines for saying less troubling things about race on social media. The third thing is more of a general observation. I'm referring to the Big G's insistence on depicting all aspects of drug use in its media inaccurately. The psychoactive effects, the addiction, the withdrawals, it's always off, always presented without nuance, always a sweaty man with bloodshot eyes in a corner of a dark room, shivering in a fetal position. People are starting to catch on. The Big G wants us to believe that thanks to its strict enforcement of drug laws, we don't see the impact of illegal narcotics in our everyday lives. Sure, the authorities seize millions of dollars in illegal substances every year, but it's more than likely that millions more dollars worth of drugs are in circulation in the country. So, 
Where are the addicts convulsing on the street? Where are the addicts breaking into stores? Where are the addicts who stab people at random? Why don't we see them? Like, ever. The best part about that video is that they scrub the comments and hit the ratings. That should tell you that even Singapore's conservative public won't let you blindly steer them into a pile of bullshit. If the Big G wants to get serious about managing the inexorable march towards recreational drug use, it has to be honest with what the science is saying. Another way that the Big G keeps the population advocating for severe drug laws is how drug-related news is reported. Mainstream news reports on drug busts often contain very little useful information. Typically, these reports will mention the ages and nationalities of the suspects, they'll mention where the sting operation went down, how the drugs were stored, the types of drugs seized, their overall value, as well as the possible sentences that will be handed down. We're never told why people do drugs. We don't know anything about the powerful syndicates that produce and supply them, but are never caught by the authorities. And we don't know about the lives of the people who become traffickers. This lack of substance in reporting is deliberate. It's designed to keep Singaporeans in the dark about the culture of recreational drug use. If the population can't empathise with anybody in the drug trade, then no one cries when drug offenders are locked away for life or sentenced to death. In the eyes of the Big G, when citizens start sympathising with those in the drug trade, it's bad for business. Perfect example is the case of Malaysian Yong Voi Kong. He was arrested in 2007 with 47.27 grams of heroin at the age of 19. Since he was a year over the minimum age for execution, the judges had no choice but to impose the death penalty. Voi Kong was not a seasoned criminal. He came from a poor family with a history of domestic abuse. He was close to his mother who suffered from depression. Unfortunately, like many lost children, he found acceptance in a gang which led him into the drug trade. While Vui Kong was on death row, he became a devout Buddhist and taught himself to read and write. According to prison officers who spoke to his family, Vui Kong was a reformed person who showed remorse for his crime. Vui Kong was lucky. Well, as lucky as one can get on death row in Singapore. Malaysian media outlets picked up on his story and ran with it. Human rights activists also put pressure on the authorities to show clemency. This garnered a lot of public attention. Many Singaporeans sympathised with Vui Kong and joined in the chorus to overturn his death sentence. This is inconvenient for the Big G. They can hang a nameless person easily. But now that noose is wrapped around the neck of someone with a name, someone with a family, someone with a history, someone that could have a future. So, what happened? Well, in 2012, the Singapore government made an amendment to the Misuse of Drugs Act that allowed judges to choose between the death sentence or life imprisonment if the case fulfilled a very narrow criteria. Lo and behold, Vui Kong was found to have met that criteria. So his death sentence was commuted to life imprisonment and 15 strokes of the cane, which may not even be a blessing if he's never granted parole. The Big G does not want a repeat of Yong Vui Kong. It doesn't want another public outcry to force an inconvenient change in the law. This is why the identities of those that Singapore executes are kept hidden from the public under the Official Secrets Act. The only thing that's public information is from the Singapore Prison Services Annual Report, which specifies the number of executions conducted in the previous year. 
If the press publishes the name of a person on death row, it's either because the external calls for clemency have become too loud to ignore, like in the case of Vui Kong, or it's because the Big G is trying to convince us that it applies the death sentence judiciously. No public revelation involving Singapore's capital punishment is accidental. I'm assuming, at the very least, that the families of those on death row know when their loved ones are scheduled to be hung. Because the alternative would be terrifying. Regardless of your stance on capital punishment, there is something very unethical and immoral about the way we treat those on death row. By taking away their identities, we are effectively killing them twice. The drug that Singapore is most worried about right now is marijuana. Because despite the legal restrictions on marijuana, many people, at least outside of Singapore, have tried it or know people who use it regularly. And they've settled on the opinion that the drug offers more positive effects and fewer downsides than we've been led to believe. Although marijuana research is only starting to ramp up due to, again, prior legal restrictions, the studies that have come out suggest that the people are right. There have been no documented deaths that can be directly attributed to excessive marijuana consumption, not to mention its addictive properties are overblown. So far, studies have shown that marijuana isn't just a mood-altering substance. It's useful for managing chronic pain. It's also an effective muscle relaxant, among other things. The medical industry has already started using cannabis to treat multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, glaucoma, nausea, depression, anxiety, PTSD, and a whole host of other ailments. To be clear, in some of these instances, it is CBD that is used. CBD, or cannabidiol, is the non-psychoactive component of cannabis. Historical research also shows that substances like marijuana, psychedelic mushrooms, and other psychoactive plants likely played crucial roles in humanity's evolution. So, is cannabis 100% safe and effective? No. Like anything that alters our biochemistry, marijuana can be harmful if abused, and it has unwanted side effects for some people. Now that several countries have lifted restrictions for cannabis research, we will develop an even better understanding of its long-term health implications. Having said all of the above, cannabis is far less harmful to physical health than alcohol or tobacco. The bottom line is, an increasing number of people don't see a problem if marijuana is made more accessible to the general public. There is also currently nothing in cannabis research that foreshadows a highly adverse impact on society if marijuana is legalized. There is, however, a lot of good that can come out of legalization or decriminalization of the drug. Making weed legal would mean putting the production, distribution, and sale of the substance into the hands of legal business entities, ensuring that the drug would have to pass health and safety standards and the people profiting from them would have to obey labour and trade laws. No more tainted drugs cultivated by slave labour and sold by children. A legal cannabis industry won't just lead to more jobs, but also provide more tax dollars for the state, which can then be used for drug education and rehabilitation programs, and of course, upkeep of public infrastructure. Another benefit of decriminalizing drugs is that it will encourage people who are addicted to said drugs to seek treatment in proper facilities, since they wouldn't have to fear arrest for admitting use. Violent drug cartels that have been terrorizing their societies and killing innocent civilians will feel the blow of having some, if not all, of their operations decimated. With less money, these criminals will have less power and therefore less influence over governments. If the law isn't being bogged down by the relentless war on drugs, policing resources can also be redirected 
to more serious crimes and other initiatives like community building. Another uncomfortable truth that Singapore wants to hide from folks is that most of the people getting hung and imprisoned for life for trafficking drugs in Singapore are mules. They are usually desperate, unemployed, debt-ridden with children to feed, or mentally challenged and easy to manipulate, or young and troubled like Yong Fui Kong. Most of them are not dangerous killers. Neither are they living the high life. Pardon the pun. They're not dealing drugs to buy luxury properties and yachts. And you know what else? Some of them are drug abusers themselves. But does it mean they don't deserve a chance at redemption? The people we execute are the lowest on the drug trade's totem pole. They are replaceable, expendable. The kingpins at the top are still tending to their opium poppy fields and cannabis plantations. They are still chilling in mansions and hobnobbing with the elites of society. We have to confront the ugly truth that Singapore's draconian drug laws impact the poorest segments of society disproportionately. By condemning these non-violent traffickers to life imprisonment or death, it is their children and families who will suffer the untold trauma of prematurely losing an irreplaceable pillar of love and support. Recently, in December 2020, the United Nations made the decision to remove cannabis from the most tightly controlled category of narcotics. This move makes it much easier for countries to conduct research on cannabis and is pretty much an admission from the UN that cannabis has positive health implications that need to be researched more extensively. As you can imagine, Singapore's Ministry of Home Affairs was very distraught by the decision. Here's their key response to the UN statement. The decision could send a wrong signal that the UN's Commission on Narcotic Drugs has softened its stance against cannabis and fuel public misperception, especially among youths, that cannabis is no longer considered to be as harmful as before, despite strong evidence showing otherwise. Rubbish. This should be pothmark. It is the opposite that has happened. We have more knowledge of cannabis today than we did in 1988, when the world ratified the UN Convention Against Illicit Drug Trafficking. This UN reversal on cannabis will allow us to understand the effects of cannabis even more, which will enable governments to create better laws to manage drug use. A few Asian nations that used to have no-nonsense drug policies are starting to come around to this shift in mindset. Thailand, for example, is allowing their homegrown companies to produce marijuana for medical purposes. These products are expected to be sold both locally and overseas, bringing the Thai government a much-needed jolt to its economy. South Korea has taken a baby step in the same direction. Malaysia is tabling it for discussions in Parliament. Malaysian Health Minister Zulkifli Ahmad said, Drugs have destroyed many lives, but wrong-headed governmental policies have destroyed many more. I think it's obvious that after 40 years of war on drugs, it has not worked. There should be decriminalization of drugs. There's one curious thing that's maybe worth pointing out. Singapore's two most vocal anti-drug voices belong to the first and second ministers for home affairs. Makes sense, since it's in their job description to condemn drug use. But we live in a world where anyone can easily show support for causes they believe in. So, it is telling that we are not seeing more members of parliament talk up the dangers of cannabis and championing a drug-free lifestyle on their respective social media, even though it wouldn't cost them anything. Or would it? It's almost as if our foreign educated politicians who have experience living in societies that have friendly marijuana laws and therefore have seen firsthand the actual effects of the drug understand why the tides are changing and don't want to look silly 
committing to a losing battle. Maybe, maybe. Something to think about. All right, that's all I have. Be well, my friends. Surprise yourself once in a while. Ciao.